This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Trajectory Energy Partners. Trajectory Energy Partners brings together landowners, electricity users, and communities to develop solar energy projects with strong local support. For more information on how Trajectory is leading the solar revolution, please visit trajectoryenergy.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. Today, we're going across the pond to the UK. We're so excited to have with us Andy Taylor. He's the Commercial Director of Green Tech Global. Welcome to the Impact Podcast, Andy. Thanks, John. I appreciate the invitation. It's uh, great to be so involved in what we're doing and a wonderful opportunity to be engaging with you. I've been looking at your business and it's a STEAM company. Uh, the feeling is mutual. And before we get talking about all the important work that you're doing at Green Tech Global, can you share a little bit about your history and your background? What led you up to the formation of Green Tech Global? Why you're so interested sure. and excited about the environment? Absolutely. Well, maybe a little bit of background. Uh, you detect I've actually got not an English accent, but an Australian accent. I grew up in Australia. Um, so I come from the world of studying chart accounting, law, and I've got an MBA. So I come from that corporate background got to it. give you context. My world started in big firms like Anderson and KPMG. I came over with the Westfield Shopping Center Group. So property, M&A, big shopping centers, then GE Capital, then Belfort Beattie, which is a big, largest construction company in the UK. And that experience of working in large corporates gave me a sense of the opportunity to really address how quickly companies at that multinational level can embrace changing the world for the better. Okay. And the challenge we're trying to overcome is the inertia of those companies to innovate and particularly to innovate in a way that addresses the ecological and the, the carbon challenge that we all face. Got it. And so I've invested in green tech with my business partner, Nick Yeekman. Nick is the, a little bit polar opposite to me, which is how we complement each other. He grew up in the world of brands and marketing and Formula One and uh, being in the music business and being in the events business. So he's very much about the branding, the sales and, and consumer relations. And then I come at it from the, the idea of the, the, the large corporate mindset of growing up in that space and, and understanding how large corporates function and how they think. And so... A little bit about us at Green Tech. So we are what we regard as a true impact investment company. So far, we've invested our own capital. And what we seek is companies and that have innovative sustainability solutions that are market ready, but haven't yet generated significant revenue because they're right at that cusp of having developed a pilot, having got their intellectual property resolved, having hopefully got their brand and their, their website resolved, but not always. And then so we focus effectively at what I call an hourglass model. So the top of the hourglass is the business development, the sales, the engagement with large multinationals. I've had 25 plus years experience working in big companies. It helps to have that sort of pedigree when you're trying to connect with people of, of our vintage on LinkedIn, which are mostly the C-suite now. And so that helps when, when we're working with maybe a, a technologist or an entrepreneur who's, who's only had you know, five or 10 years experience, but very smart, well, we're relying on our experience to then be able to knock on our door and start a conversation about their technology. Wonderful. So, how long ago did you start? Andy, how long ago did you start Green Tech Global? And for our listeners and our viewers out there that want to find Andy and Nick, they can go to greentech.global, greentech.global. Um, when did you start it? In about 2015, we launched. Got it. So we, we launched with a couple of, uh, of, of very innovative companies, uh, which I, I can happily explain. Yeah. Uh, one of them is, is uh, yeah, so, so these guys were focused very much in the, in the infrastructure space. One of our very exciting companies is a formed and founded by an ex-banker. He had the similar experience to us of a very successful banking career. He invested in a team of polymath scientists. And what's fascinating is they've developed a way of making graphene very cost-effectively. 
don't know if you've heard of graphene, but it's 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 uh, quite a revolutionary um, discovery. Ten years ago at Manchester Uni, they won a a uh, Nobel Prize for their work in the idea of taking pencil lead and, and shaving it and working out that graphene is the smallest form of carbon. Oh. And it's the, one of the most conductive substances, one of the most uh, strongest substances known to mankind. And it, I feel it is gen, genuinely going to revolutionise the future of our children. Really? When you, look, when you look at its capabilities across a whole suite of different areas, um, this is in batteries, it's in uh, carbon fibre, it's in polymers, and it's in uh, paints. So in, in broad concept, when you add graphene to any particular product line, you end up with an outperformance result. In the battery space, they've resolved the chemistry, so it's not quite just graphene. It's not just as simple as taking it, but there's different grades of graphene, and there's a debate as to what is graphene in the world. There's different discussions happening all the time. But essentially, they created a... a formula that is a combination of different nanotechnologies that when you add it to the cathode the electrolyte and the anode of a battery you end up typically with around a 30 percent increase in energy density for a like for like comparison to say a typical lithium-ion battery wow and we've they've demonstrating that because our simple model to clients is you don't have to believe us just send in your back current battery specification we have a template for them to complete he then works with his outsourced uh, contract manufacturing partners ostensibly in Asia, where they've got all the supply chain and very long-term established pricing, and they will give you a comparable uh, outcome. In one case, a client of mine, which we've brought to him as a client in Italy who's, who's designed his own mopeds with partners in China. He historically had a, a swap-in, swap-out battery for the, for the moped that was about 12 kilograms. Sorry, I need a kilograms. We're in the UK. Um, and we took that battery down to eight kilograms for the same power. Wow. Now that means your wife as an avatar, John, or your daughter can now lift the battery out comfortably, more comfortably and take it inside right. and charge it overnight. And, and that's the kind of Delta in that instance. Um, in, in the, in, in other cases, he's doing some very interesting work in the, in, in the domestic energy battery and solar market. Because he's a commercial banker, what he's done is he's now providing a complete turnkey solution of batteries, solar panels, and air source heat pumps. And that's wrapped and delivered by his own installation company. And that's allowing him to generate some very significant new market share in the UK in competition with some of the big established players. And in his case, his batteries are roughly 15% smaller, 15% lighter, and 15% lower cost than the other incumbents in the market. So this is some of the exciting stuff we're working on. And if you want to hear even more about what we're doing um, on this particular instance, I've brokered another client out of the USA. He's a, a wealthy uh, mining magnet, I'll call him. Made a lot of money out of, uh, re uh, out of reprocessing old iron ore tailings. He's invested a lot of his private capital with a team of, I believe, ex-Tesla engineers and others to create an, an electric drive unit. His mission is to convert existing diesel and petrol vans and cars into electric cars. What my client is doing is working on partnering with him to deliver a swapping swap out battery solution. Beautiful. That's great. So you can imagine, if you imagine taking, if you imagine taking a Ford Transit van, an existing diesel Ford Transit van that is currently used ubiquitously in most cities to deliver a lot of Amazon and other last mile delivery products. Right as a big source of pollution. Well, with this, the combined combination of these two companies, and if we homologate that in the sense of working through the mechanics of it becoming a factory supply solution, in the sense of you, you put the car, you put a Ford Transit through the process on day one and day five, it ends up, it comes out with not, it's ice engine replaced, it's internal combustion engine replaced with an electric engine and our batteries. And our vision is to put the batteries in a way that is possibly in the back of the van so that the driver can now access them. And instead of having to worry about range anxiety and get back to a, a back to base somewhere to then charge overnight, instead they'll turn up at various locations where they can access a locker, change the batteries over in five minutes. 
Now, there you have a commercial case, you see, for that same delivery company only having to invest maybe under $10,000 to do the conversion. We'll then lease the batteries to them. And that means they're not polluting anymore, which means they're actually allowed into certain city centres, which are slowly banning diesel and petrol vehicles, delivery vehicles. I know they're doing that in the Netherlands already. Right. And what we're doing is addressing the commercial drive where that where they can now use that at that van 24-7. So if you imagine three shifts of eight hours, at the end of the shift, they will change the batteries over. At least enough to carry on for the next eight hours is the vision. And that way the vehicle continues its journeys in a non-polluting way. And we've solved the commercial case where people with a lot of the existing fleets, which have still got five or 10 years of effective life of the vehicles, unable to write them off, now able to repurpose them to generate another five or 10 or 20 years of life. That's a tremendous That's partnership. And one, one example, one or two or three examples of what right. we're trying, what we're doing and the thought space of solving it commercially, you see. Right. That's the critic. We have to, to, to deliver an ecological, sustainable, lower carbon outcome now in, a, in the world we're in. You have to have a commercial business case underpinning how you engage a large corporate. Right. They yeah. can't afford to just do a token green outcome. Right. Unless you're playing an optics game of planting some trees and claiming next era, which is a nice debate in town at the moment. You know, um, for our listeners and our viewers who just joined us, we've got Andy Taylor with us. He's the commercial director of Green Tech Global. To find Andy and his partner, Nick, go to Green Tech dot global compared to when you started the company in 2015 andy to today 2021 Mm. is the climate no pun intended is the climate and social political economic structures in europe united states and asia now more excited about esg and circular economy behavior than ever before I'd absolutely have to say so. My observation is we are facing a green rush at the moment, as in, you know, in the 1850s, whenever there was a gold rush. Right, right. I I foresee right now that there is a green rush. And in some respects, I think COVID has woken up a lot of people to the idea of the the environment is now, can be malicious Mm. in a material way if we don't look after it. Okay. Historically, you know, people, science has been warning about global warming and, and rightly so, and Greenpeace has been doing and WWF have been doing a great job and those others to highlight the risks we face. But until it's really in your face, people are, aren't really minded to change their behavior. Right. Most people go about their day worried about, worried about how to pay their mortgage or their rent, worried about their job, worried about their family life. And the environment hasn't had to factor too much because it's someone else's problem. True. And, and what I feel is, is that the, the evidence of the science and the 2050 agenda in what the United Nations is doing to address this and obviously taking heed of the scientists has now built up, I think you've got past a tipping point where governments are realising the implication of, and seeing the evidence slowly of, of you know, what, what appears to be a shift in global warming patterns where more and more natural disasters are, are impacting significant populations. You know, heat waves in 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 the in in uh, northwest America causing fires. Similar examples in in Australia. They're under flood at the moment. Um, so th- those those scenarios, I think, are starting to engage a lot of individuals worried about their future. And and that's now now it's now nicely feeding through into people who care in the form of pension funds. And the big sovereign wealth funds now starting to take heed of putting pressure on, on, on large global corporations about now, how do they accommodate the investor concerns about what they're doing on, 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 an, on, a, um, on a global front? So the nice thing is you've got politicians slowly starting to wake up to the idea that their constituencies are concerned about the environment and that if you don't address a green outcome, then they will get pilloried in, in social media. You know, in the UK, we've had had various action groups that are, you know, taking a lot of, um, are gaining a lot of publicity for the disruption they're causing in terms of sitting on streets and campaigning around around the environmental concerns that they have, and so government is having to address that. Um, our mission 
is, again, it's about what can we do across the piece now to bring either a business case to a corporation to change their, their carbon profile, to either to help a company establish a brand story that is true and genuine about what they're doing to save the planet. And I can take you through some of the stuff we're doing there. And also we're moving a lot now into the consumer space where we're looking to address a lot of the behavioral science around what might motivate you or myself or my family and my friends to change their behavior in an ecological way. Talk about some of these other um, investments. And, and can I give you a little anecdote? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, can, can I give you a little anecdote? Of course. One thing that, um, that you know, I work in the space, but quite a revelation is, would you believe the shirt I'm wearing is made out of recycled bottles? Right. So this is one of our new products we're bringing to market. And I'm wearing I'm from another, from another cl not a client of mine, but a third party, a gentleman who does uh, recycled cotton yoga clothing um, for men. I'm wearing his yoga pants at the moment. And would you believe I actually feel emotionally better? I feel happier during my work day wearing my eco clothing. How does it feel? And how does the how does the clothing feel on your skin? This is just like a normal polo shirt that I've got three or four or five examples of from major brands. Right, right, right. Right. I, I the 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 recycled cotton is obviously even well, it's soft and it's comfortable. I don't have to stand up, but you know, recycled cotton pants if you can see it. Sure. Oh, wow. um, okay. You know, wow. so they're very comfortable to work in. I go walking in them. I got a few pairs. And, and you, you know what? I'm actually no, but the other thing is the psychology, and maybe I'm like I'm unique because I'm in the eco space. But you know, if you're going to tell your friends a good news story, right? If you're looking to chat to them about something, well, actually, I feel quite proud now to just say, hey, I'm wearing recycled um, cotton yoga pants. It's something to talk about, right? Right, right. It's something to actually be a little bit proud about that I'm trying to make us as a little individual in the world of many millions and billions i'm trying to make my little difference and it's on brand right in some sense maybe to have this little philosophical conversation for you in a moment maybe some of your listeners will be interested which is i feel the world should shift to a new paradigm which is no matter how rich or poor you might be we should be celebrating minimalism how minimalist are you in the sense of your impact on the world in terms of total carbon and total pollution and total waste. Why aren't we as a culture celebrating people making that effort to minimize their carbon footprint in a meaningful, sensible way as a point of kudos, as a point of personal reputation, as a point of self-confidence? Right. What we seem to do is celebrate, no disrespect, I'm not trying to be socialist, far from it. But right. what I'm saying is we seem to celebrate those people who drive the biggest, fastest, petrol cars right who have the biggest homes for example and have the biggest ocean going yachts and things and the world seems to celebrate the idea of all of those classic examples of wealth there's the way to recognize whether someone is genuinely successful or someone is not as in terms of how much money they make and my proposition is actually well that is a statement that you actually don't care about the environment because you're a massive carbon generator you just are you know, what are we saying to people now about if you care about the environment, well, what are you driving an electric car? If you can afford it, you should be driving an electric car. And there's some beautiful hypercars coming. There's the Rimac coming for $2 million. That's, got, that's fully electric, right? You can drive, and it's faster than most other things in the world that are powered by petrol. Right, right, right. It just is. So, you know, if you've got the money, celebrate driving an electric vehicle. If you've got the money, celebrate having an eco home that's as eco as it can be. It can be the biggest home in the world, but it might have solar panels all over it. It might have ground source heat pumps. It might have all sorts of ecology. Well, deploy your resources into showing that you care. And for those that want to make a difference, you know, go on brand. So it's not about you know, necessarily wearing big brands it's about wearing clothing that you feel comfortable in and also you're making a statement that doesn't have a horrible supply chain around it in terms of everything to do with not only its carbon footprint but then obviously child labor and all those other things come into play well two points to your point about you being in the eco business as as i am 
I still think that everyone really is in the eco business because Andy, no matter who you are in terms of uh, social status, uh, economic status, or uh, political affiliations, when you and I have friends and relatives and other people around us, who doesn't agree that we all want to drink cleaner water, breathe healthier air? So really, we all should be in the eco business, number one, just making the world a better place from wherever right. we sit. Right. And to your point about bigger you. macro shifts, right. I think we really are moving from, thank gosh, finally, a linear economy to a circular economy. And that bodes well for what you're doing yeah. at Green Tech Global and what we're doing here at ERI and 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 yep. so many of our colleagues are doing. So I, I think yep. it's great. Uh, is the material you, you've invested in those companies of the shirt and the pants that you're wearing right now? Not in the pants yet, but and and the shirt we are we have a partnership with that company where we're helping to deploy their product range under our new brand. We're launching a new brand called Ocean, OSHN. We mm. haven't launched it yet. We're still still in uh, developing our, uh, our our catalog, if you like. Um, what we're doing at the moment is is trying to work with large corporates to encourage them to to use the these clothes as uniforms. So you see, part of the part of our strategy always is with new technology. We try and launch it first into our corporate relationships, where it's on brand for a company to then adopt the technology. Trying to sell into a corporate market is always a struggle for every every new consumer brand because it's so frightfully expensive to try and convert people. You have to see something, John, seven times before you'll buy it as a standard protocol, which is why so many companies struggle to get their product into the market unless they're very well resourced or can tap into an automatic natural uh, a, uh, database of individuals. Right, right. But oh. through, other, through our various initiatives, we are slowly, we are, we are going to be building our own considerable networks of eco-aligned individuals because part of what we're addressing on the consumer front is the behavioral science of motivating people through discounts and rewards and 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 eco points to demonstrate their 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 involvement in in the in the full cycle yeah recycling and, and recovery economy. But to your point also outside of the reward system, economic reward system I think there is a, a huge psychological reward system that that's for free that come, that accrues to people that are actually behaving, you know, behaving more ecologically speaking and actually thinking about what they're doing and more responsible behavior than historically yeah. they've been doing. Yeah, but the challenge for them is is how to demonstrate that to their to their peers and family and friends to get the the kudos from it, right? Okay. Historically, historically, someone can wear a branded shirt. And that makes a statement because of the advertising of that brand about how they correlate into you know being a, being affiliated with that advertising. My challenge, this is my point around the minimalist example, is that if we build an, um, an ethos and a, a personal recognition where I can say to you, John, hey, what are you doing about minimalizing your impact on the environment? You can proudly say I'm doing X, Y, Z and you. And that's my contribution. And I can say that's amazing. I give you total respect for that, right? When you're having a beer with your friends, you know you're talking about these things around what is your what you know, and and it is something not about your new car outside, if it may be electric, of course, but you're talking about actually what difference you're making and them get, and people giving you real respect for it. Interesting, uh, Andy. Talk about your your uh, your thoughts around employing a head of sustainability delivery at companies, and what does that mean to you, and why is that so important? Sure. So. What we've identified in in engaging with a lot of multinationals, um, I'm, I'm talking to some of the biggest brands, some of the biggest listed companies in the UK right now about some of our, our solutions in terms of promoting to them. And I've been in touch with some of the, you know, I'm connected on LinkedIn and, and other, loca- other places with some of the global heads of sustainability, some very big companies. And if you look at the experience of heads of sustainability, they are often very uh, educated and, and very, very capable in terms of the whole sustainability agenda, and they've grown up in that world. The challenge they face personally is that they may not have had a lot of co- corporate and commercial experience in their organisations. And my point is, let me just explain a little bit, just a little bit of backstory. So part of when you're engaging with a very big corporation, my philosophy and, and experience is that CEOs, are fundamentally the only ones given the imprimatur by their shareholders and their board to innovate. 
They get paid to innovate. They get paid to see the future. Okay. And it's a high risk, high return relationship. If they're successful, they get remunerated wildly. If they fail, they get kicked out pretty quickly. And they are always betting on innovation and future to grow their business and to future and to pr- prevent their business from being disrupted from outside forces. Right. Very other, very few other people in the hierarchy are given the permission to innovate and take risk. Right. Most people, if you look at your organization, trying to go up the corporate ladder, right? They are paid to do their job as to what they did yesterday. They are bonused on last year's numbers plus 10%. Right. If they come to you with a new idea. Let me give you this example. If they come to you with a new idea, like a new innovation, a new concept of reducing, you know, reducing your carbon footprint, as a business owner, your and, and your concern will be if that fails and causes you brand harm, causes you commercial harm, causes you litigation harm, if it's unproven, untested, untried. And if it goes all wrong, that individual's career just came to a screaming halt. Right. The only way that that person can can prevent harm to them is to coalesce a number of other people in the organization to sign off on the idea and they collectively take it to the CEOs as a, as a, as a concept. So if you play that forward, our vision is that if, you, if companies are meaningfully wanting to engage with market-ready sustainability technologies, the idea of a head of sustainability delivery is a partner to the head of sustainability and they will be someone who has five to 10 years commercial experience within the organization having delivered operational outcomes in terms of delivering what they do for their clients. By function, they will have a natural network of a lot of peers in other, in other segments of the business, as in the legal community, the risk management community, the finance community, the HR community. The idea of the head of sustainability delivery is that they will, first of all, be a gateway for new innovative sustainability technologies to contact, to share their ideas, to share their concepts. They will understand what the sustainability remit of the company is and evaluate them quickly as fit for purpose or disregard. If they're worth exploring because it aligns to the company objective, they have the imprimatur and the permission of the CEO to then motivate the analysis of that technology across the different business segments. They can go to the head of engineering, the head of IT, the head of legal and say, hey, I've got this new idea. What do you think of it? From your lens, What's the legal risks and associated with this in terms of warranties and indemnities and balance sheet you'd expect if you're going to sue them? From the edge of our engineering, what are the risks of contamination or any other variables in terms of this risk management paradigm of solving for the, how you operationally deploy the technology, how you evaluate the idea? Because you see, most, most other people in the organization are going to be sitting and thinking, why didn't I invent it? Right. And it's only going to cause me more, more, only going to cause me more work right. because it's new and incremental to my current day job. So that's why you need a head of sustainability delivery to motivate those different business segments to get behind it because the CEO is ultimately behind them saying, hey, you're going to innovate and we're going to actually reduce our carbon footprint meaningfully. I need you to engage. And so they marshal the different business segments and that that collective very quickly rather than having to rely on personal favors because you've got a good idea. They now have the, the, the imprimatur of the CEO to make those people engage. And the idea is they quickly then collectively evaluate the viability and the business case for the technology. They very quickly agree it, it has a business case. They quickly sign off on it being piloted within the organization. They very quickly then evaluate the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats of that technology. If it works for them and the business case is sound, they can deploy it quickly. You accelerate their carbon outcome. Interesting. And, or their waste outcome or whichever eco right. outcome this right. particular right. thing right. is solving for. Right. And, 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 and that way, the... the, the it's the head of sustainability is held harmless. Right. Right. They are held harmless for pushing the idea through the organization. Right. They have the ability to motivate the whole organization behind the innovation. And then the idea is accelerating what is typically a three to five year buying cycle for a new entrant into a company like a multinational. My goal is one year. Got it. Because then there's no point about 20. See, if you, see, if you think in 2050 terms or 2030 terms, that's beyond the career lifespan of most of us today who can make a difference. Right. So the people in central, the people in senior management have roughly had to have 20 years, 30 years experience, which is our generation, people between 40 and 60, right? Right. Most people at 2030 are thinking, I'm retired. What, what can I possibly do to influence things? Right. My 2050 is like most of us will be in the grave, right? right. So 
you know, depending on on on, on gen- you know, other conversations about right. lifespan. But the point is, right, it's outside our influence zone, so you don't motivate. My point is, you're on watch today. Let's make a difference on your watch. Most SEO careers, roughly five years on average, give or take. Let's make a difference today. Show a meaningful outcome. Oh, and by the way, if you want to appease your shareholders, here's some great news about demonstrating your credibility and capability in space. If you've got an, an environmental, social, or governance bond, well, now your finance director is very happy because you've got a, the lowest rate of interest possible, having tick all those boxes. If you've got a young millennial workforce, they really care about the environment because that's their future. They've seen what COVID's done to their families and their, particularly their parents and their grandparents. They don't want that to happen to them. So the, they're all very aware, alert and awake, being very um, digitally aware to what the environmental damage is that they're inheriting. I feel emboldened by what I'm doing at the moment because I've got a 13-year-old son and a 10-year-old son and I'm giving them the legacy of what we're doing now. Right. I feel our Generation X, roughly, you know, the, the legacy of the last boom is starting to retire and, and the, um, you know, it, we're, in, we're in management now. It's our opportunity and our responsibility to deliver these outcomes for our children because who else will not to be evangelist about it it's about well i've had 30 years experience i've got the connectivity and the network to make these things happen i've got the experience to have the conversation with you in a meaningful way to say listen here's a business case i've thought through the matrix of all of these legal concerns warranty concerns insurance concerns let's make it happen and frankly with the sort of stuff that we're being attracted to and seeing you know, I can guarantee making a carbon difference to pretty much every company we engage with or a waste difference. We've got a portfolio, not to, not to, to be you know, marketing, because, I mean, frankly, it's our mission to market these companies. We put our money in them, which gives you the confidence that we put our money in them. So there must be, must be something worth it there in terms of why we're putting our reputation and our brand at risk with representing this technology. We must have due diligence in it. We must have understood it. That's an important right. statement. We're not just sales guys trying to make a buck and then be gone. Right. And that's, so that's important. Two, it shows that we're in for the long term. You know, we're about life cycle. It's about making a difference in terms of our mission is to make the world better. Right. And so that's what we're, that's what we're quite passionate about, if you detect any passion of mine, which is I, I have, I'm seeing these technologies. I'm witnessing the business case and the brand case and the story that drives real outcomes. Now, it's just about finding the, the right people in the right companies to embrace talking to us not, and then evaluating it quickly, rule the business case in or rule it out. In most cases, they should see the value equation of why it makes good business sense to engage with us. And keep in mind, our philosophy is inevitably we want to be manufactured direct. So we're not working through, we're not, you know, commercially, we're not walking, you know, working through three or four different middle people trying to take margin. Right. All of our companies, we aim to be manufacturing direct, which means we control the full vertical of the of the conversation around pricing and and delivery and quality control. Right, right. And we're therefore about you know this whole conversation around making it meaningful company for companies. John is is the mission. Andy, what you know, like you said, it is our responsibility because of our unique relationships and historical track record to make a difference now, not push it off on another generation and not, not take the slow mm-hmm. approach. I love your approach of working with a sense of urgency that makes total sense. Given that science is winning this tragic pandemic period that we're all living through around the world, mm. you mm. included here in California and UK and London, what do you foresee for you and Green Tech Global in the next 12 to 18 months as we become untethered from the, the, the pandemic and get back to the business of making the world a better place? Yeah, what, what's fascinating is we've been on this long journey with these, with these clients like the, uh, the Iconic Battery client, another technology out of France, Denae. Uh, which has got a device that connects into air conditioning units and is proven to reduce the the energy cost of those by fifteen to fifty percent. Right. Uh, they've been through their piloting stage, so we just out of total serendipity and coincidence, uh, and obviously COVID's put a lot of them back a little bit. But we're very pregnant. I, I'm saying to our, you know to my business partners, 
we're very pregnant now where we've got you know, pretty much a baby about to be born in the sense of a number of our portfolio clients with established credentials. Right. They've got deployed solutions in a number of verticals. So we're actually very well primed to be launching all this now just at the perfect time when companies are starting to address, okay, I've got a brand problem. I've got a workforce problem. I've got a stakeholder problem. I've got an investor problem around making myself be really green. Right, 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 right. So, frankly, I'm hugely excited by function of what we're building uh, in the sense of starting some real conversations with some clients where historically we've produced it, shown them an idea and they've said fine, but then radio silence. I'm now being able, now being, I'm able to go back to them to say, hey, check this technology out. There, you can go and visit it in a house or you can see it on a moped. Or well, here's the vehicle, here's the, 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 the van we just converted. It's real. It's here. Uh, do you want to taste it? Do you want to touch it? It's in proof. It's in proof. So let's have a conversation around how we can make this meaningful for you. I love it. Well, Andy, the, the fun part about this show is that we've been doing this 13 years. and We love to have our guests back. So you're going to come back as we move through 2021 and get into 2022. I want you to come back and share the success stories of Green Tech mm. Global I, I want you to know that you and Nick are always invited back on the show. And for our listeners and viewers out there to find Andy and his colleague, Nick, please go to www.greentech.global. Andy, really, this has been a pleasure. I love what you're doing. I love your sense of urgency. And I'm so grateful to you for sharing your story on the Impact Podcast today, but more importantly, making the world a better place. Thank you for joining us today. John, it's been a pleasure and, and you know, we welcome engaging with anybody who'd love to uh, be a part of our story because it is genuinely about making the world better and uh, we hope to be on mission with people. So uh, feel free to reach out. We'll be delighted to have a conversation with anybody who wants to make a difference. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by The Marketing Masters. The Marketing Masters is a boutique marketing agency offering website development and digital marketing services to small and medium businesses across America. For more information on how they can help you grow your business online, please visit themarketingmasters.com. <laughs>